Can Purdue do what Virginia did in 2019 and win the national championship one year after losing to a 16 seed? Or will NC State's miracle run continue to the final game? You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, folks? Happy Wednesday. Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, a daily national college hoop show, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are your co-hosts. I'm Andy Patton. He is Isaac Shade, and you are joining us at the place to get your college basketball and NCAA tournament and transfer portal content every single day. Folks, want to thank all of you who have made this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. Shout out those of you who are everydayers and those of you who have joined us in our Discord channel. If you want to do so, you can just click the link in the show notes on audio and video platforms. We're talking college hoops all day long in there. Also want to mention that you can listen to this show ad free on Amazon Music. Definitely go check us out there if you have not done so yet. Isaac, we're talking storylines. We're talking key matchups. We're talking big big picture all about Purdue and NC State. We will then talk about UConn and Alabama on Thursday's show, get some more Final Four stuff for you on Friday. For today, after we talk Purdue NC State, we're also going to hit some coaching rumors, including a big one about Eric Musselman and USC. We'll talk about that and some transfer portal news to get you out here today. But let's start with the Boilermakers of Purdue, a team that last year, of course, very famously lost to a 16 seed in Fairleigh Dickinson. Uh, the conversation all throughout the season was about whether they could do what Virginia, the only other team to ever lose to a 16 seed, did the following year, which was win the national championship. Well, so far, so good. Purdue is here. They're in the final four. They got a matchup against a red hot NC State team. Then they got a matchup against either UConn or Alabama. We'll, of course, get to that when that time comes. But for right now, I want to talk about how this Purdue team came from a disastrous loss a little over a year ago to being in the position they're in right now. Yeah, Andy, it is some kind of really, really neat story for Purdue. Like, I think these are the things that we often look at and just it's like, Man, this is what's so fun about college basketball. I mean, I just remember back to my feelings for Virginia. Like, what a great redemption story that was. I love hearing all this year about how Tony Bennett has been communicating with Matt Painter. Like, I love that uh, community of coaches taking care of each other in those ways. And Andy, Purdue has basically just gone out and done what they did last year. 28-3 28 and 3 in the regular season, 17 and 3 in the Big Ten, won the outright regular season championship by three games over this Illinois team that's just gotten better down the stretch. And quite frankly, those three regular season losses, it was by four in overtime at Northwestern, by 16 at Nebraska. That's the only outlier weird thing on their schedule. Four at Ohio State. And then they lost in the Big Ten semis again in overtime by one to Wisconsin. So, Andy, I mean, it's been a really, really put together year for um, for the Boilermakers. They've pretty much run their way through the NCAA tournament, mm-hmm. grambling by 28, beat a good, a really good Utah State team that we both liked by 39 points. Yeah. Andy beat Gonzaga by 12 and then held off that wild performance from Dalton Connect and the rest of the Tennessee Volunteers, beating them by six on Sunday. And I think with with Purdue, this has been the story all season long is whether they can do this. And I think because they had such a strong regular season, because they're so talked about, because Zach Eady is so big and so polarizing, it almost felt like, feels like people kind of treated them getting to this point as maybe not like easy for them necessarily, but like it, it didn't feel like they're getting a lot, like it's really hard to go to the final four, even as a one seed. Right. And you know we're not seeing all one seeds here for that specific reason. And to do it with that pressure, to do it when you're looking at a team that is, it's, it's mostly the same guys. And I think that in some ways that's good and bad. Like it's not only hanging over the Purdue program, but the majority of the players on this roster with, you know, the, the notable exception being Lance Jones, were, they experienced it like they were here for that. And so to be able to shake that off, uh, I think, is a testament to the the player's mentality, uh, to their grit, their, you know, all that stuff. And I think it's a huge testament to the coaching staff, to Matt Painter, to be able to get this team to to shake that off and not feel that in this, you know, in these situations where, you know, they didn't look 
like they were playing, you know, playing not to lose against Grambling by any stretch. Like they went out and dominated that game. Uh, Utah State was the first game where a lot of people were like, hey, this could be a trendy upset. I'll happily admit uh, to have picked that game. And I was wrong by 39 points. Like they just crushed them in that game. And, and even when they faced adversity in the first half against a good Gonzaga team, they took care of business there. And, and I think when you talk about whether this team can pull a Virginia, the phrase we've been using a lot here on, on the show, like absolutely they can. I mean, they, they, UConn is incredibly tough and that's the potential matchup they'll face. They have to get through NC state first. And we by no stretch want to look over this NC state team absolutely not. has played incredible for the last month of, of the season and has beat a couple of really, really good teams. But to Purdue is very capable of doing this. And I think part of the conversation is whether like you of course want to get there, but have they already kind of completed the redemption arc? You know, they're already in the final four. They already went way farther than last year. And I, I know if you were to ask Zach Eady or Matt Painter or Braden Smith, like, hey, do you guys feel like you've done what you need to do? Like, they're going to say absolutely not. Like, they need to win a national championship. Zach did. <laughs> he right. did. Yeah, they, they already directly said that. But I do think from, like, an overall narrative perspective, if their season were to end before they got to that point or in that championship game, you certainly could look back and say, what an incredible story for them to have kind of overcome that adversity to get where they are. But I know, like I said, like we said, they're they're looking at it as they got one goal and they haven't accomplished it yet. Yeah, Andy, and as you've said uh, multiple times, uh, mm-hmm. funny enough, if they do lose, it will be a fourth straight year of losing to a double-digit seed, mm-hmm. even though it's in a different way. So what a funny thing there. Andy, yeah. um, as I look at a key storyline for Purdue, one of the things coming into this season that I feel like we said a lot is, Zach Eady going to be Zach Eady, right? Mm-hmm. The question is, what happens to everyone around him? So for me, perhaps the biggest non-Zach Eady storyline is the maturation of the now sophomore backcourt of Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer. Um, these guys really, really, truly have risen to the occasion. They took so much of the brunt of the FDU loss for kind of just like freezing up and in the moment mm-hmm. being too big for them last year down the stretch. Andy, I looked back earlier today at their rankings coming out of high school because I couldn't remember exactly where it was. At 247 in the class of 22, Fletcher Lawyer was ranked 122nd, the 16th best shooting guard in the class and the fourth best player in Indiana. Braden Smith, it's even lower. Mm -hmm. Ranked 216th, Andy, the 33rd point guard and just the ninth best player at Indiana. That's great if we're talking about, I'll just say Indiana State, because they're playing as we speak Mm -hmm. in the NIT semifinals in Hinkle, by the way, which is super rad. Like that would make sense if these guys are your starting backcourt at Indiana State or ooey pooey or something else like that if i'm not if i'm remembering correctly and i apologize if i'm not i believe the only other d1 program that recruited braden smith kind of fits this bill and, and it was belmont and wow. then he was going to go to belmont until uh, matt painter said okay well why don't you come here yeah i don't remember that off the top of my head but that does sound right like there is mm-hmm. something like that but andy yet these two dudes were the starting backcourt for the Purdue Boilermakers in the Big Ten. This is one of the biggest brands in all of college basketball. The fact that they were able to do as well as they were last year is mind-boggling to me. But, Andy, so much credit to these two young men who have risen to the occasion. I say this and truly believe it, that Braden Smith has been one of the best point guards in the entire nation this season. Mm -hmm. Kudos to them. That, to me, is a massive non zach Eady storyline. Andy? As you look at Purdue, let's get a, a key matchup from the Purdue vantage point. Yeah, I think you got to go Edie versus Burns. I mean, it's hard to pick any other, like there's other matchups, things that I think will come up that, that will be critical in this game. But at the end of the day, this game is going to be determined in the front court and it's going to be determined by how NC State chooses to attack Zach Edie. And more specifically, if we're talking Purdue side, what does does Purdue go heavily with Zach Eady? Do if NC State doubles or triples him, are they going to be more reliant on swinging the ball around? Are they going to try to have Eady score, like just get Burns and other guys in foul trouble? Like how are they going to going to attack this? And then for, for Purdue on the defensive side as well, Burns is a, is a player who he's a great low post scorer. He's got great footwork, but he can also you know step away a little bit. He's not a great outside shooter necessarily, but he's a good passer. And I think we could see. NC State attempts to move move Edie away from the rim, and then how does Purdue respond to that? Do they 
you know, put Trey Kaufman Wren on, on Burns and let ED kind of roam the paint more. Like, I think that that's going to be a big key on both sides of the ball. I would be very surprised if ED doesn't get his in the sense of a 25, 10 caliber performance. Again, Burns is only six, nine. So, I mean, there's a huge size advantage for Zach ED in this game, but uh, yeah, I think it's, it's hard to pick against ED being the key matchup situation for really both teams in this game. Andy, my key matchup is actually not a pl- specific player. It's going to be Purdue's three-point shooting against NC State's three-point defense. For folks who might not realize it, because all you know is Zach Eady's real big and he scores at the rim, Purdue has the second-best three-point percentage in the entire nation at 40.6. And it makes a ton of sense because Zach Eady is a black hole that draws all sorts of attention. And mm-hmm. then when he kicks out, guys are getting wide-open shots. They got to knock him down, and they have been doing so. Now, as for NC State's three-point defense, they're 141st in the nation, allowing 33.3%. So while that that ranking sounds a little middling, there's a massive difference between 40.6% and 33.3%. And so I'm really curious to see where Purdue's three-point shooting falls. Is it closer to what they average? Is it closer to what NC State holds their opponents to or somewhere in the middle? Andy, I think that is a massive matchup to watch. Also, keep in mind, Purdue, while they shoot a great percentage, doesn't get a ton of their scoring from outside. Just 29.8% of the Boilermaker scoring comes from three. I would imagine that is in part because of obviously all of Edie's scoring around the rim, but they also have a very large chunk of their percentage or their points from the free throw line, which yeah. again, we didn't mention here, but is clearly going to be a factor in this game as it is in every Purdue game is how many fouls the opposing team picks up, how Edie does at the free throw line, not only from a Purdue scoring perspective, but from a getting the opposing team in foul trouble and, and limiting their ability to, to do what they want to do because of their short bench. That's how Purdue has won a lot of their games. And, and I think will be a big, factor in this one as well. Andy, very quickly, let's do a why they will, why they won't win uh, the national championship. I I think one of the won'ts is we look ahead to a potential matchup with UConn and the idea that Donovan Klingon could, could potentially slow Zach Eady down. That seems like the most obvious reason why they wouldn't. And I would also just quickly throw in the idea of what I just talked about is that they're not knocking down outside shots and allowing their opponents to suck in on Zach Eady. Yeah. And I think from the will perspective, it's, it's the fact that you don't need just Zach Eady to win like that last year's team was more reliant singularly on Zach Eady. Uh, the guards were good last year, but they were not as good as they are this year. They have matured as you've talked about, they've improved. And I think that the fact that even if Eady has an off night, even if Eady uh, you know, is is neutralized by somebody like Klingon. I, I think that this team can beat you in multiple different ways. And that wasn't uh, wasn't something they had in their bag last year. And they do this year. And I think Painter's a good enough coach that if things aren't working with Edie, they can still find another way to beat you. And that makes them really hard to stop, especially if they get a matchup with uh, one of the few bigs in the country who might actually be able to slow Edie down. Andy, that's kind of the look at the Boilermakers. We're going to switch benches and go look at their opponent, NC State, who needed, by the way, a missed free throw in the ACC tournament semifinals to even make the big dance. And now, Andy, they're just two wins away from doing the absolutely unthinkable. We'll tell you more about the Wolfpack coming up in just a second. Right after I tell you about Amazon Fire TV, your destination from sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV to provide access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV. So whether it's March Madness or the beginning of the MLB season, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. I've got an Amazon Fire Stick on every TV in my house. I love the layout. I love how the user experience is so friendly. I love this little handy dandy remote where I can go straight to Netflix or Prime Video or whatever. Fire TV also recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. And that includes us here at the Locked On Podcast Network. Not to mention great news and entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. So check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa-enabled devices. If you haven't done so, you really should trust us on that. To learn more, visit Amazon.com/slash Locked On Fire TV. 
Today, we're looking at the first national semifinal to take place on Saturday. It will feature the Purdue Boilermakers against the 11 seed <laughs> NC State Wolfpack. And I laugh because it's just the sixth ever 11 seed to make the final four. Andy, this is absolutely bonkers. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how and why the Wolfpack were able to do this? Yeah, what a fun story. I mean, it's 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 one of those things where, you know, I think we, we at least I, I think a lot of people associate these like, uh, you know, these these trendy runs to the final four, the upsets, the Cinderella's, whatever, with being mid-major teams. And you don't always associate them with being teams that have, you know, won national championships and have one of the most famous, you know, coaches of all time in Jim Valvano and have rivalries with, you know, North Carolina and Duke. Like, that's not typically the kind of team you associate as like the plucky underdog getting to the final four as an 11 seed. But that's, I think, what kind of makes this journey even more special in some ways. Like, this is a team that needed five wins in five days in the ACC tournament to even get here. We alluded, you alluded to it earlier, the Isaac McNeely missed free throw by Virginia leads to Michael O'Connell banking in a three to send that game to overtime. If, or if NC State doesn't win that game, they don't get an at-large bid. They're not here at all. They're maybe playing right now in the in the NIT, perhaps, but they're not in this tournament. They, guaranteed, they they guaranteed, they're not in this tournament. Um, and and frankly, they may not have made the NIT. Like they were a ten seed in the ACC. Like this is a, a crazy story for them to be here. Uh, I love the fact that Kevin Keats had a contract extension that only kicked in if he made the tournament. So he got his team in gear to win five games in a row to make the tournament. So now he's extended through twenty thirty. I feel like if you're NC State, you probably don't feel that bad about it right now because of how successful this team run has been lately but uh, again this this story is so intense because this is a team that ended the regular season losing four straight games they ended the regular season losing seven out of their last nine games like this team was they only had a four game winning streak that's their best win streak this season before now they did it twice and both times it was not against particularly good teams like this is a very wild story. They get into the tournament. They get a six seed in Texas Tech that they beat in the first game. They do draw a 14 seed in Oakland in the second round. And sure, you could say, oh, that makes their path to the Sweet 16 a little bit easier. But then they played Marquette and Duke. Like, not, not exactly uh, rollover teams. Marquette, the two seed, of course. Duke, the four seed. Uh, they beat Duke two out of three times that they played them this year. Like, this is a really fun story. Uh, and it's punctuated by the fact that DJ Burns just might be the most charismatic, smiley, enthusiastic, happy player in college basketball. He just looks like he's having an absolute blast out there. Uh, and why wouldn't he? He wasn't expected to be here, and yet here he is, the face of one of the best underdog stories we've seen in college basketball recently, and a guy who has the potential to push his team all the way to the national championship. So, Andy, let's talk biggest storylines from an NC State vantage point. For me, I want to look at both the improbability and the historicity of <laughs> this from Evan Miyakawa, who does a great job with college basketball analytics and data and stuff. Andy, he tweeted this out. I had seen this the other day. NC State has won nine straight elimination games to make the final four. Using pregame win probabilities, the chances of this happening were 0.0097% chance. That's like <laughs> what? Nine that's into the thousandths yeah. of a percent put a little more easily. That's 10,314 to one odds of doing this. That is absolutely insane. Just to give you a little idea of that, but the history of it, Andy, you think back to the wild survive and advance nature of the championship. They won under Valvano in 83. You think about kind of the historical moment of having both the men's and women's team in the final four, by the way, along with UConn, it's the first time, Two different schools have had both their teams in the Final Four. So that's really rad. Like, I just love moments of this. By the way, mm -hmm. folks, if you've not watched the um, Survive and Advance 30 for 30, it is phenomenal. I would suggest you do that in the lead up to Saturday because it is some kind of special stuff. And so uh, NC State, just a school having one historically magic run in the postseason like this is, is the stuff of legend. Yeah. For NC State to have two of those seasons – that 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 just doesn't happen. Andy, what about you? Yeah, I, I picked my, my storyline for Purdue was whether they were going to pull a Virginia. So I'm going to kind of stick with the theme here uh, and have my storyline for NC State be whether they can pull a UConn. And what I nice. mean by that nice. is in 2011, Kemba Walker's led UConn team won five games in a row to get into the NCAA tournament. That does not happen very often. In fact, this is the only other time that that has happened. And that UConn team, as many of you will remember, Cardiac Kemba, they won the national championship. And 
NC, we joked on the show a few times of like, well, NC State's probably not going to do that. I mean, you know, that they that that UConn team was better than this NC State team. They had a higher seed than that, et cetera. They had a you know a future NBA All Star in Kemba Walker on the roster, and yet NC State's still here. They're still playing. They only have two more games left. Now the two teams they're going to play are Purdue and then either Alabama or UConn, that same team that did this, you know, 15 years ago or 12 years ago, math, 11 years ago. <laughs> um, but it's it's this insane story for this team to even be in this position to have had to win those five games. And I mean, they're, the sample size is now two as opposed to one. So it's obviously not something you can really track, but there's probably something to be said for going on a really hot winning streak right before you get into the NCAA tournament. Like I'm not, I'm certainly not surprised NC state beat Texas tech just because they had a lot more momentum than Texas tech did coming into that game. Not, you know, then they get a, a, decent draw against Oakland, but this team is playing phenomenal right now. They clearly have found something. Something has clicked with this roster. And while I don't, I'm not betting on them to win the national championship. I think very few are at this point. Uh, a lot of people weren't betting on UConn and they did it too. So who knows, maybe they can do the absolutely unthinkable, unimaginable, find a way to slow down Zach Eady, win that basketball game, go to the national championship and take down potentially the only other team that has ever done this in UConn. That would be insane. It would be quite a story. All right. Isaac, what needs to happen for them to get there? <laughs> well, th that's a great question. The The key matchup I'm looking at is the other DJ. We all know about DJ Burns. You've been talking about his jovial nature. He's the big man, 6'9", 275. I mean, that's just so much. But you might not have paid as much attention to the other guy in the DJ booth, and that's DJ Horn. Um, because in actuality, DJ Burns is this team's second leading scorer, while DJ Horn is the man in charge, scoring 16.8 points. He He's the guy, if, if you saw the picture of the dude flipping off the ref at the free throw line, that was DJ Horn, man. He's got an edge to him. Uh, he's a little bit wild, but um, it's got to be the DJ and DJ show. It's not just Burns, and it's not just Horn. They balance them this team out from an inside-outside standpoint. So watch out. If you've only heard of one DJ, make sure you know the other. Andy, what about you? I, I was kind of digging through some of the numbers using some of Ken Palm's data, which is always fantastic, and, and kind of found something that stood out to me as a potentially intriguing aspect of this game. Uh, NC State turns the ball over about 13.7 times per game. That's ninth in the country according to Ken Palm. Meanwhile, Purdue, while they are a very good defensive team, they don't force a lot of turnovers. In fact, they are 343rd in the country in terms of forced turnovers uh, at 13.6, almost the exact same amount of turnovers that NC State averages. What I'm curious about is how much of a factor this will play because you can not turn over the basketball, but you still have to make shots. And more than that, you still have to prevent the other team from making shots or making free throws or whatever. So I'm not I'm picking this as my key matchup element of the game, although I'm not actually sure how much of an impact it's going to have. Where I think it comes into play is if NC State finds a way to get a lead because then they can slow the pace down. Mm. They play at about a league average pace, but if they slow it down, they can take possessions away from Purdue. And at that point, Purdue will probably be you know, trying to play more aggressive defense, potentially force some turnovers. That may not be an area that they're very good at, and especially not against a good a team that is good at preventing turnovers. So not that it's going to be easy for NC State to get and maintain a lead, but I do see this particular stat as something that could be of could have a significant factor in this game, particularly if NC State finds a way to build themselves a lead in the second half. All right, Andy, very quickly, uh, the the why will they, why won't they on the national championship? Why don't you give us the why they won't? I don't think this team is big enough to handle Zach Eady. Like, I, I mean, I think that the, winning the national championship would also require them to beat either UConn, who's one of the best teams we've ever seen, or Alabama, who would then have somehow just beat UConn. So that's going to be a really tough, tough task if they get there. But I'm just not sure how they're going to handle Edie. I mean, Burns is just not big enough. Uh, double teaming is tough with Purdue's outside shooting. Uh, I love this, this team story and I did not pick them to pick to beat Marquette. I was a little more confident they might beat Duke, but I, you know, I've picked against them a handful of times. So I, you know, at the risk of picking against them again, I just don't see this as a matchup that is particularly beneficial for NC state, but uh, you know, you never know. And on the, on the positive side, it's like, why are we going to look at this magic and say it's going to end? It's rolled in ways. I mean, you just heard me give the probabilities. It's wild. So 
let's say they will do it because the magic keeps rolling. They're on fire from outside and they somehow figure out a way in the final four to neutralize Zach Eady enough. And by that, I mean like limit him to only 20 and 10, which is absurd to say, but Andy, I mean, that's kind of the truth of what you, yeah. what you got to do. Um, but man, it, it's a different ball game now having the, I mean, it's one thing to beat Duke and Marquette. It's a whole other thing to beat Purdue and UConn or even Alabama. So we'll watch out for that. Well, Isaac, Eric Musselman is taking an interview to replace Andy Enfield at USC. Huge potential coaching carousel move here. If he goes, what does it mean for USC? What does it mean for Arkansas? All of that coming up. But first... I want to tell you about today's sponsor, FanDuel. Folks, the sports calendar is loaded, and FanDuel is making it even more exciting to get in on the action because right now new customers will get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 you can use to bet on the tournament, MLB, NBA, NHL, and so much more right now. Purdue is favored over NC State by 9.5 points in that game. Meanwhile, UConn favored by 11.5 points over Alabama. And you can even find lines for potential national championship matchups. You want to bet on what an NC State Alabama game might look like or UConn Purdue or any other combination, you can do that at FanDuel right now. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a big W. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. All right, Isaac, lots of movement in the coaching carousel and the transfer portal. We've talked about it a few times on the show, but having all of this stuff happening at the same time, if coaches got to be worrying about the transfer portal and the NCAA tournament, I guess we do too here on Locked On College Basketball. The latest is a rumor that Eric Musselman is taking an interview to be the next coach at USC following Andy Enfield's departure. Enfield took the job at SMU. Uh, as you joke, he's leaving the Big Ten for the ACC, which feels incredibly bizarre to say, but it's true about this situation. So uh, Musselman, obviously former head coach at Nevada, from, has, has connections to the West Coast. Not a good year at Arkansas this past year. Serious problems there with some some just dysfunction on the actual team. The performance on the court was not good, but Muss has done some phenomenal stuff making this Arkansas program relevant. This would be a really big loss for the Hogs, for USC, a coach who loves the transfer portal, who loves, you know, who, who recruits as almost as well as anybody in the country, getting to go to USC in Southern California with their resources, their NIL money, moving into the Big Ten. There's a lot to really like about what the future of USC basketball would look like if they managed to convince Musk to leave Arkansas and, and come out West. Andy, uh, at, would, th would this be a step up? That's what I, that's what I've been mm -hmm. trying to think about. Like, I, like, I feel like Arkansas basketball, I would rather be there than USC, yeah. right? Like I, I just, I keep going back and I know there's the Nevada roots or, you know, the, the pedigree there with coaching there, but mm -hmm. I feel like all things being equal, I'd, I'd rather be in Fayetteville. Yeah, you know, the huge arena, huge fan base, SEC, I mean, I mean SEC and Big Ten, I suppose, is, is more comparable than that's than right when it was the Pac-12, but right. like the SEC, SEC basketball right now is in a really, really good spot. Uh, and, and USC is moving into a, a situation where there's going to be this extra travel and they're going to be kind of an outlier in the Big Ten. And and certainly from a resource perspective, like, I mean, both schools are huge and have a yep. ton of money and, yep. and NIL money and donor base and all that stuff. I don't think that that USC is, is failing in that regard, but they don't have the basketball success lately has been good but historically it's been kind of average like i'm not sure I, I think that if this is a step up it's minimal yeah and and i i don't think it is obviously a step up i also don't think it's necessarily a step Perfect. down although That's i'm right. sure there's some it feels more that. yeah it feels pretty lateral yeah. but if you're must again this this year really didn't go well and i think that there's maybe some i don't think people are trying to push him out that would be insane but i i do think that maybe there's some some frustration, some some potential animosity. I, I'm not, I don't know for sure. I'm just saying that that could be a reason that you would leave for a lateral position, um, especially if you you know maybe he just wants to be out west. Maybe he likes the weather better. I mean, honestly, it could come down to something that uh, something at that level when these two jobs are pretty comparable otherwise. Yeah, he likes the beach better than Walmart, I guess, Andy. And uh, for those who you who don't know, by the way, that's that's not a knock on Walmart. It's just Walmart's headquarters is just north of Fayetteville yeah. and Bentonville. Um, 
But uh, thankfully, he'd be going to USC, who had a great season, a banner year for the Trojan. Uh, whoops, no, Wait uh, a minute, bad, nope. bad year for both. I was going to say maybe you're talking about football, but no, they didn't actually do that either. <laughs> uh, Andy, Chris Mack is back. Last coached at Louisville. Now he's taking the Charleston job, vacated by Pat Kelsey, who's going to Louisville. So it's just a little swip swap brother thing. There you go. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how that goes for Chris Mack back at Charleston, which is you know a, a really interesting move there as well. Andy, very quickly, let me give us three portal commitments that we've seen. One of them, literally, as we've been podcasting here, Eddie Lampkin, he of uh, most recently, anyway, Colorado, is now going to Syracuse. Michi Johnson from South Carolina has committed to Ohio State. And Zeke Mayo from South Dakota State is going to Kansas. So Bill Self's trying to get more guys that he can play off his bench there. Andy, anything before I get us out of here? I uh, just would point out that I was really hoping Zeke Mayo would go to Creighton. They were rumored to be involved in his recruitment. I think it's a good fit stylistically, but also Baylor Shireman, South Dakota State to Creighton became one of the greatest Blue Jays of all time. Would have been fun to see that pipeline continue, but it's hard to turn down Kansas. And I think this is a good fit for him there as well. Yeah, I understand that move. Well, folks, that's it for today's episode. As Andy said earlier, tomorrow we'll preview the teams from the other national semifinals. So make sure you're with us for that. If you're not part of the Locked On College Basketball Discord community, come join us. As Andy said earlier, the link is in the show notes. If you're not subscribed on video and audio, please do that. Hit that little bell button so you get a notification when we go live Saturday after the final four games. As always, apologies to the lawyer family. Let's go Wildcats and until Thursday. Peace!